uh, providence. Providence, he says, uh, is a more or less disobedient being, yet part of the plan of things. Perhaps in the words of Mephisto in Faust, he is part of the power of good while ever working ill. Prometheus represents individuality. It represents the gradual dawning of selfness within the individual. And this is an act of providence. Providence was the lightning flash that ensouled life. Now what does providence also mean? when we be, uh, analyze it in this particular context. Providence tells us that the human being was intended for a purpose. That man was providentially created. There is no accident, no superficial incident, not that a fish crawled out of the water and, and walked away. It is nothing of this nature at all. Man was part of the plan. Providence had ordained him, and Providence became his leader and his guide. Now, while the human being was in a desperate state of uh, primitive existence, living as an animal, or with no particular skills against the pressures of a prehistoric world, living in a, in a, in a world of creatures that were not endowed with any uh, providential capacities, Prometheus brought him fire. And Bacon makes a great point of the fact that fire, on this level of things, was the beginning of civilization. And fire, in the spirit, is the beginning of religion. Uh, the, but in the material world, fire enabled man uh, to gradually attain supremacy over his environment. Fire made it possible for him to uh, ha cook his food, heat his cave. It made it possible for him to fire pottery. It also gave him the skill to make plows and later, unfortunately, to make swords. So fire was a twofold power, a power for good, which as light brought him out of darkness, and a power for evil, when as force it began to release the innate cupidities and ambitions locked within him. But fire was the beginning of man's separateness from the environment in which he lived. It was the beginning of that providential factor which brought him to the rulership or leadership of the species of the earth. Now, uh, Bacon makes a great deal out of this fire factor, and he also goes on to show how fire, as serving all kinds of purposes, became in itself a mysterious deity, a deity which uh, apparently is self-born, for the fire springs up. When it dies, it is dead, but it never dies as a principle. Every fire on the earth could be put out, and yet fire would come back. Fire became a kind of divine agent, a symbol of all the skills, all the powers, all the potentials possible to man. So in uh, the development of this power, the inner nature of the human being gradually divided. And from the unity of his ignorance, he divided his internal into a duality of ignorance. He had two power factors at work. He could use fire to build. He could use fire to destroy. He could use it to make life better for everyone. He could also use it to destroy cities and worlds and perhaps get around to the nuclear hypothesis, which of course was a little earlier, was a little late for Bacon. But in any event, it became the most powerful factor in the world of man's experience. 
the human being confronted with this was confronted with the supreme opportunity and the supreme temptation. Fire enabled the individual to protect his kind. It also provided him with a means of exterminating his kind. And fire gradually developed into the symbol of what we might call fortune. It became the symbol of wealth. For wealth came out of fire. Even coinage was coined by heat. Fire became the means of bringing the precious metals from the earth. Fires burned on the altars of the gods, and fires also burned in the camps of armies. Thus a strange division began to take place, and according to the Baconian theory, this division under Prometheus was a strange providential force. I think the Bible also gives us, and Bacon was very well acquainted with the Bible, it gives us the clue to this situation in the struggle between Cain and Abel, in which we find the beginning of the struggle between common good and personal ambition. Now the parent of this problem was Prometheus who was very personal and therefore had a great desire to do what he pleased. This factor also was incorporated in the gift which he bestowed. The usage of it was to become the great test of human nature. It was this usage that by which providence would ultimately bring about the redemption of mankind. It was the testing, it was the tempering, and the sword of spirit had to be tempered in the flame of suffering. So suffering became the punishment for mistake. It was not some deity sitting somewhere to punish people. For the mistake and its punishment were one thing, each inherent in the other. A reward for good is part of the good of which it is the reward. They are one simple substance, each producing its own kind inevitably. So providence brought about this struggle for power. And out of this struggle comes another interesting uh, mythological figure, and that is Fortuna or Fortune also sometimes represented by a figure called fama or fame. Now fame is represented as a human figure standing on a sphere, in one hand holding a bridle and in the other an urn. Therefore fortuna or fame is the measure of so-called greatness. As uh, we know, the path of glory leads but to the grave. Fortune and fame are bridles which destroy the liberty of the individual. And in the other hand, fame holds the urn to hold the ashes of the ambitious dead. So, fame also stands upon a sphere indicating absolute insecurity and instability. There is no safety in fortune or in fame, but in fire, inspired by the discovery of fire and the rising power of the individual to work his own will upon others, fame and fortune came into existence. And from, those, and from these pressures we have not yet recovered. It represents a matter of lack of insight. Now Bacon points out very definitely in these more important works from which these fables are extracted uh, that the end of all education has to be the, the discovery of what is intended, that the only truth that is important is that which is concealed in the divine mind. 
that whatever was to be will be. This was one of the inscriptions on the tablets of Nebuchadnezzar. And it was partly attributed to Nebo, Lord of the Writing Table, in ancient Babylonia. That which has been, will be. And it goes on to point out that every action has a reward natural to itself. And integrity and justice is not that the reac reaction shall be what we want, the real integrity is that the reaction is that which is necessary to universal good. So in the story of the struggle of Prometheus, we find uh, providence and we find many different factors moving man forward to a series of stages or steps in which he ascends this pyramid of Pan. We find him passing through all the stages uh, that were involved when Prometheus, in a sense, put man together. Uh, Prometheus was among those who are said to have fashioned humanity. And when he put mankind together, he took a, a germ or a seed from all other creatures, birds, animals, fishes, insects, everything, and put them inside of man. The result is that Man has within himself every level in his body of nature. He is tied to Pan by every cell he has. And he is tied to the animal creation by not only his body, but by his material propensities. His body is of the earth earthy, and the earth is Pan and nature. Therefore, the part that rises out of this, the humanity in him, made possible through fire, very often comes into direct conflict with the nature of his lower life. Now man is not supposed uh, to destroy all these uh, little seeds that were planted in him by which he partakes of all living things. He is supposed to become the Orpheus. He is the one whose sweet music will charm all the creatures of the world. Therefore, through his own harmony, he charms all of the lower parts of his own life. If he lives in harmony with beauty and truth, all of the beasts of his inner life follow patiently and lovingly with him. As in the beautiful legend, of St. Francis and the birds. The lower parts of man are not bad. They are simply good and useful parts of his complete economy. The beasts of the field are not bad. But when man declares war upon the beasts of the fields, then there is an imbalance in nature and an inevitable consequence sets in. When the individual disobeys the laws of the nature within himself, he comes in the end to a great tribulation because he has perverted the natural powers. It is his purpose to civilize the animals, not destroy them. And when he ignores his responsibility to the animals around him, he also ignores his responsibility to the animal seeds in himself. It's a very beautiful and very uh, interesting, constructive kind of fable. Other fables of the same general type and so forth uh, take uh, considerable thought. There was a time where it says that heaven, he, uh, in fact Bacon opens his story of the fables with the story of heaven as a great vault in which all things take place. It's almost the alchemical retort for under heaven as all enclosed the creation as we know it. Now heaven was deposed by Saturn, and Saturn in turn was deposed by Zeus. And Bacon says that by heaven we are to understand the totality of things, and by Saturn, matter. 
and he gives a great deal of thought to that. We associate Saturn symbolically even today with crystallization and death. Bacon says that Saturn is matter, the material substance from which all things must be molded. And uh, in explaining this, he gives us the fable of Proteus. Now, Proteus was an old hermit uh, who guarded a flock of sheep, and he had magic powers and could conjurate. And anyone who wanted to capture Proteus, which is the symbol of forever change, must ensnare him by magic and must then wait until Proteus takes on all the different forms that he can assume at will. He becomes every kind of thing that you can imagine. He becomes birds and insects and fish and everything. He becomes visible and invisible beings. But you must continue to hold him. And when ultimately he is forced to return to his natural form, then you can capture him. So this, says Bacon, is the story of matter. This is also the story that we have forever with the changing essences and substances of life. Every form of matter passes through innumerable changes. To capture the mystery locked in matter, we have done everything we can. We observe all of the transformations in which matter rises from the most simple form to the most highly organized creature. We see in matter the proteus, that substance which can take any and all forms. And in any and all of its forms it may be examined, but it can never be captured except in its natural form. Therefore, we must patiently observe the disguises under which it appears, but never hope to understand it till we can restore it to its native condition. This, I think, was one of the great inspirations behind Bacon's philosophy of life. He was a profound student of matter. He wanted to know how it came into being, where it came into being, what it was all about. Because he believed that matter was a series of infinite disguises in which a simple thing becomes increasingly more complicated as the evolutionary processes result in the piling up of mathematical patterns of matter. All these forms uh, may bewilder, but anyone who tries to capture those forms will find they slip through his fingers. He thinks he has found the proper and true form, and as he takes hold of it, it changes. So Bacon points out definitely that there is no way in which we can understand substance, essence, matter, unless we can examine it in its inevitable and natural state, and as he points out, in its most natural and primordial state, it is invisible. This uh, leads to the Baconian deduction, namely, that we must study things by what they do, because we cannot find out actually exactly what they are. If we study heaven as the great globe within which all the alchemical experiments of existence uh, take place, we must then seek to know the Creator as represented by the infinite diversity of creation. And here the Creator becomes a Proteus. For one principle, one truth, one reality, takes on an infinite diversity of forms and appearances beyond conception. Yet somewhere, underneath all this infinite change and diversity, there is one simple fact. But man has not yet been able to become simple enough to find it. He assumes that he will discover it through complications. But he, Bacon points out that he must discover it by the reduction of complication and not by the magnification or expansion of this same complicated principle. 
always also uh, Bacon is concerned uh, with the legistic phase. Uh, we have in his concept the idea of a, a government. He took a long, hard look at the government of Olympus. And he realized, obviously, that in its literal form, it could not be true. But if you took the twelve deities of Olympus and examined their attributes carefully and substituted their attribute quality for their name, you came out with a rather good legal system. You found that all of these beings and powers have a valid part in the administration of the world. That there is no doubt that underneath the network and webwork of myths, there is a legistic form, there is a structure which can be made applicable to almost any system of government. This is true because this government is stamped and sealed upon the individual. Olympus is within each of us. It is a representation of the type of government with which we administer the small nation of our own personalities. Now many people uh, can't understand how it happened that the Greeks, who were a naturally rather thoughtful people, could get along with a god like Zeus, who was a philanderer of good parts, who was uh, supposedly very temperamental, and who was bossed to death by a nagging wife. Now how all this fits in together uh, to form a divine being seems a little difficult. But Bacon uh, tells us in one of his works, I seem to remember it, that the answer is very simple. All you have to do is look at yourself. There is something in you, the leader of yourself, which for most people is the mind. This mind is Zeus. And if you can find any more irresponsible leader than that, it'd be difficult to imagine. The mind always tells you to do whatever you want to do. It proves to you conclusively that your faults are virtues. It leads you into every type of complication. And if it wasn't for the mind's problems that it creates, you wouldn't need a lawyer to settle them. So if uh, we use ourselves as an example, we see that the, the individual, in the management of that which he can manage, and the only thing we can hope to manage finally is ourselves, uh, the, the individual is very delinquent in his managements. He does what he pleases. This is supposed to be the divine right of kings. They have a right to be tyrants. The individual forever feels that he has a right to be tyr a tyrant, and most are to some degree. He also has the right to make and unmake rulers and powers. He has the right to declare war upon the drop of a hat. He has the right to make friends and declare enemies. The right to accumulate anything he wants and fight bitterly to prevent someone else from taking it away from him. He is constantly inconsistent in his attitudes and self-centered in the extreme. Therefore, you couldn't imagine a better world god than that. Remember, Zeus is not the great deity. He is the, the Zeus is a sort of a major domo. He is what the Greeks call the demiurgus, or the lesser deity who rules only over the temporal world. He is accountable to the divine as a good governor of the temporal world and its problems. In the individual, the mind is not actually the supreme power. The supreme power is vested in an invisible spirit to which the mind is accountable, whether it knows it or not. We have the same thing in the Nordic mythology. Odin, or Wotan, is not the supreme god. He is simply the god of the twelve deities dwelling and the palace of Asgard. Above him is All-Father. 
invisible, unknowable, to whom Odin and all other things are accountable. Bacon uses the simple analogy of, the, uh, of Zeus to indicate this secondary deity, for everything is a god of that over which it has dominion, and the mind has dominion over the body. And the mind, because it has this dominion, uh, it tyrannizes the body. It sets this body into very false procedures and ways. In order to prevent the mind from continuing in this procedure, uh, Bacon developed his inductive system of reasoning. Based upon the simple and inevitable truth of the matter, that the mind is the thing that must be improved, that in its present state is hopelessly inadequate. The mind must, therefore, uh, give attention to those things which are above it, and not all the time to those things which are below it. Instead of the mind spending its all, its, all its time tyrannizing over the outer world, or trying to govern it, the mind should first of all Deter, turn its attention to the higher world in order to understand what is necessary and what is wanted. It is that reason that Janus, the Roman god, has two faces, one which faces the public and the other which faces the god. In uh, this case, the mind must uh, become aware of that which is beyond the mind, because the mind of itself is earthbound. It is bound to the situations which arise from environment, heredity, and circumstances. And it is often the victim, very much, of the mysterious deity Fortuna on the globe. The opinions, customs, knowledges of humanity change from day to day. They become more complicated, taking new forms as Proteus does. But they do not become solutional. Each new form is a new problem. Each new discovery is a new danger. Because the mind is not capable of guiding itself by itself, and when it attempts to do so, it becomes a dictator. So uh, in, the, in the Baconian system, uh, the only answer to the world's problem is to find out what the world wants needs and must have according to providence, according to the great laws of things, according to the rules that are inflexible and unchangeable. Another interesting little fable that comes along in connection with this is the fable of, Promethe of uh, Persephone. It's Persephone representing the human soul is abducted by Pluto and taken into the underworld. Her mother, Ceres, the goddess of nature, descends to the underworld and tries to rescue her. And she is helped in this way by Pan, who is the first to point out where her daughter has actually been abducted. Mercury goes to save her, but cannot do so, because she has already eaten part of a pomegranate, the symbol of generation. Therefore, the soul is captured in generation. Finally, however, uh, a, the deities uh, intercede, and Persephone is permitted to return to the upper world half of every year. Now, the meaning lying under this, it seems to be, of course, that the uh, Ceres and Persephone were both agricultural deities. Therefore, the seasons of growth summer and winter become the two halves of the year. In these two halves, vegetation in the winter fails, and it is said that Persephone is locked in the underworld. In the spring, she is released and returns to the heavenly worlds above. But there is another interesting interpretation of this fable, namely that the soul descending into body is what, is what makes body fruitful. And all the good and all the true life of, of man is vested in this soul power or soul quality. 
And uh, when God breathed the breath of life into man and made him a living soul, this was the beginning of man's journey upward toward truth. And the soul, of course, Bacon always aligns to religion, assuming that the spiritual integrity in man is the direct manifestation of soul power, and that the soul it abides in him a part of the time, and at death it departs, but at birth it is reborn. And the soul coming into embodiment is the perpetual guide and guardian of man's life. Uh, the, uh, the legends go on uh, in very many interesting ways. Now, for just a moment, supposing the gods had to take an oath, who would they swear by? Now, to Bacon, who was a lawyer and probably had a good many perjury cases, this comes to be a problem. It wouldn't be very possible to do, as in one book that was written years ago, uh, Heavenly Discourses, uh, God swears by saying, by myself. But uh, the Greeks didn't do it that way. The great oath of the gods was the oath to the river Styx. Uh, the river Styx was the stream that divides the world of the living from the world of the dead. It is forever flowing, never ends, and became in Greek mythology the symbol of the inevitable, the immutable and the unchangeable. That which be before gods or men. In other words, the complete mystery of life itself. It was that mysterious power from eternity the ever-existing essence of life, which was the highest unknowable for all things that live, from the gods to the smallest atom, live because there is life. And this life, therefore, became the most sacred of all things. And when the gods took an oath, they took an oath to the river of life. All of these are quaintisms in their own way and seem strange, perhaps, but there are tremendous values hiding in these things. There are moral lessons that it seems to me we will all benefit by. And while we are using our natural faculties, it might be interesting for us to see what would happen if we would take some of these legends and interpret them according to our own insights calling upon the internal to find the meaning of a symbol. And this is the power of symbols, that they bring out of us something. And any person in any walk of life can take one of these myths, bring it down to the level of his own experience, and not only get a useful answer, but may also get a clue through the symbolism to the laws involved in the situation in which he finds himself. I think this was the principle and idea that was behind Bacon in the production of these mysterious and truly charming fables. And we think that it was an interesting enough subject that we wanted to share it with you. Thank you very much.